I think there's, there's no doubt that the pandemic itself is the overarching factor that's pulling together other contrary and uh, adverse effects that are leading to the spike in gun violence. I mean, the pandemic has initially crippled the economy. Uh, it uh, isolated people. People felt more insecure for a variety of reasons and in a variety of ways. There was a rise in domestic violence and domestic discord, more people home for longer periods of time. Uh, so it's kind of the overarching factor. But you add to that the fact that uh, millions of people went out and bought guns, including uh, around 20 percent of people who had never owned a gun before. Mm -hmm. And that means more guns in circulation. And that itself has been critically important to explaining the rise in gun violence, because the, uh, murder can be committed in many different ways, but most murders in the United States are with guns, and there is no implement that's more effective at killing another human being than a firearm. And the very fact of the circulation of these weapons, it, 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 there's no question, uh, has led in a diffuse way to the rise in murders. And it's also notable because while violent crime has increased in this past uh, couple of years, really, right. uh, nonviolent crime has remained the same. So that's a doubly indicative of the role of the pandemic and contributing to that, uh, the circulation of ever more guns. And also suicide. The suicide rate has also gone up significantly as well. Now, in that story, we heard that really any meaningful discussion about gun control measures seemed to be drowned out by this heated rhetoric. What can we do to try to bridge this gap and bring some kind of conversation back to the table? Well, there is an immediate step that is now in the process of being implemented. During the pandemic, a number of anti-violence programs were in operation around the country that were pretty successful at dampening gun violence, but those programs were largely frozen because of financial reasons and also because you couldn't have interactions person-to-person -person interactions with people at the height of the pandemic. And the pandemic is not over, but it's substantially subsided. And the federal government is now providing significant new funding for these programs. And people are able and ready to re-engage. And these programs have demonstrated that they can indeed be effective at zeroing in on violence hotspots right. around the country, mostly in large cities. And they have been very effective. They have bipartisan support. Uh, and we have one other conflict, confounding factor, which is the Supreme Court seems to be pushing in the other direction, saying, and, and it may be prepared to rule that uh, even existing gun laws may run afoul of the Second Amendment, even though pretty much everybody agrees uh, not everybody, but there's uh, historical and legal consensus that that uh, overextends the Second Amendment. Yeah, Robert, we're kind of tight on time, but I really want to talk about one thing that was very clear. So much of what we see here and the people we hear from, people of color, people of low income, they are disproportionately affected. Young blacks, Native Americans, Native Alaskans affected in higher numbers. What can we do to break this cycle? Well, that, that again is a place where you can target the regions where that's occurring, the families, the communities, the neighborhoods, and send people in, uh, people who are trained, local people, people who can make interpersonal connections. And the other part of this, too, is to rebuild relationships with local police, because if people are angry at or afraid of the police, they're less likely to go to the police mm -hmm. if they have a tip that something bad might happen, um, and and to work with police to solve crimes and to thwart crimes. So a better engagement with local police is the other piece of this puzzle to bring this rate down.